Hello all, my name is Karsten. I'm uh, working with the Free Software Foundation Europe. And I would like to talk to you today about access to knowledge, um, especially about copyright, patents, and politics at the World Intellectual Property Organization. Uh, please let me know if I'm talking too quickly, if you have trouble understanding me. Um, well, just uh, an overview of the contents of this talk. The first part, we could say, is a bit theoretical. What is access to knowledge? What is this formula that's been showing up here and there during the last year or so? Um, why is it important? What are the concerns I have with the term intellectual property? And um, what could a treaty on access to knowledge be good for and what should it lo look like? Then in the second part, um, I'll talk about the work that a lot of NGOs, including the Free Software Foundation Europe, uh, do at the World Intellectual Property Organization, WIPO. First, I'll give you a short introduction to WIPO, what it is and what it does. Then, um, what opportunities WIPO holds for promoting access to knowledge or on another, from another perspective, what obstacles it presents on the same topic. Well, then I'll uh, present a first step, which has been taken at WIPO, the development agenda. And uh, finally, say a few words about what uh, my organization, FSF Europe, is doing at WIPO. There will be opportunities for questions, well, um, in general, after the, after the talk, I'd appreciate that if you could just hold it that long. Um, but after the first part, I'll draw a short summary, and then if, there's, um, if there are things that you want me to explain a bit more, then I'll gladly do that. Okay, so let's go. What is access to knowledge? What is knowledge, anyway? We could say that knowledge is any cultural technique, anything that uh, humans do to... Uh, bring about a culture. Music is a sort of knowledge. Music brings people together. together. Medicine is knowledge. It helps people cure people. It helps us sustain ourselves in the physical sense. Science, of course, is knowledge. I don't think any explanation is needed here. And uh, software is knowledge as well. Software, as most of you probably better, know better than I do, is really just knowledge about processes. You take, if, if you want to write a program to uh, solve a certain problem, to take care of a certain task, what you do is you deconstruct this task into steps so simple that even something as stupid as a computer can perform them. And then you describe these steps in a manner that um, the computer understands. That is what programmers do. So um, software is knowledge about processes. Thanks to digital technology, uh, it's very easy to distribute knowledge. Um, if you have something to say to the world, just put it up on the web. If you're looking for something, you look it up on the web. Beautiful. That's an opportunity. Though uh, some treat it as a threat. I'll, uh, we'll get to that. The access, access to knowledge really is something, you could say it's a perspective a perspective where you value knowledge and access to knowledge and uh, everyone's ability to learn over the protection of individuals or mostly companies really um, to profit from a monopoly on knowledge. Why is access to knowledge important for culture and development? Well, as for culture, without, without knowing things, without knowledge about, about the culture, it's impossible to take part in one. Uh, reading and writing is a very basic example here. Someone who cannot read or write, at least in our Western societies, uh, does have indeed a serious problem. I'm sure you will agree here. Literature also is something. It, it carries the ideas we, we have about our culture. It um, communicates uh, ideas between all of us. And it's a, so, literature is really a sort of discussion. Software understanding software, being able to use software, maybe being, even being able to write software, is also becoming ever more important. 
you run into software all the time. This is not actually a phone. It's a computer. It just acts like it's a phone. And uh, by the way, I should turn it off, I see. Um, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> so um, software, we encounter software in places where our parents probably never would have thought about there being a computer. Well, why is it important to be able to exchange all these things? Why, why is it important to be able to exchange software, literature, the knowledge about reading and writing? Um, because our culture grows on a common ground of knowledge. Because to create, first you have to receive. Because to write a book, you have to read perhaps a hundred books before. Because to write a program, you have to look at a lot of program code. I'm not a programmer myself. My background, like Micah's, the previous speaker, is in cultural sciences. The only thing I can do is very basic HTML. But what little I learned here is due to looking at other people's code. So um, reading books about HTML never took me very far. That is why restrictions on access to knowledge hurt us all even if it's only individuals being restricted, because these restrictions make the afflicted individuals less productive. They cannot contribute as uh, their potential would perhaps allow them to. Um, this means for those individuals less personal freedom, because probably every one of you has a book, for example, that has been very important to your, to your growth as you were young, or maybe you even, you're even reading a book in, during these days, which is important to you. Um, so if you, have, wouldn't have that, if you wouldn't have had or wouldn't have access to that book, you'd probably be lacking something. Um, but for all of us, as a collective, as a culture, restrictions on knowledge, restrictions on access to knowledge mean um, that if, as in, if all the individuals making up the collective do not reach their full potential because of these restrictions, then we as a society, as a whole, as a collective, we will not reach our full potential, be it in the cultural realm or in the economic area. Uh, much the same goes for development, although here, access to knowledge can quickly turn deadly. Um, Developing countries suffer a lot more from access restrictions than we do because um, in the Western world, in the rich countries, in case of doubt, we can buy our way out of restrictions. We can buy a license. We can buy a book. That is something that many people in developing countries just can't. It's not an option for them because they have to buy food first. Um, so, for example, even if a developing country or least developed country manages to print a school book, um, manages to set up this rather complex process, to would manage to distribute the books through the schools, they might run into trouble when it comes to paying the licenses for the educational texts they want to use. They might, there might just not be the money for this kind of thing. Even more dramatic and even more obvious um, is the lack of money in the area of medicines. If uh, the best example really is AIDS medication, um, where there is still an ongoing struggle between the pharma companies and uh, NGOs helping people, most of all Medicine Sans Frontieres, excuse my French, Doctors Without Borders, um, who are running an access to essential medicines campaign. Because, for example, maybe if you've run into this, in the, at the end of the 90s, 90s South Africa realized that they were suffering from a most severe AIDS problem. And um, what they didn't have the money for was buying the, the medicine to at least, while, a, while, while you cannot cure AIDS, you can sort of uh, soften the impact. And um, so South Africa went ahead and said, well, you know, there's AIDS medication, but it's patented. And uh, the pharma companies are charging way too much money for the, for the license to use the patent. So what we do, we, have, we declare a national emergency and go ahead um, producing this regardless of the patent. Um, that's what they did. And the pharma companies went to court and sued South Africa. They eventually had to pull back the suit um, because of international pressure, because of the pressure that Doctors Without Borders and other NGOs created. 
So, um, you know, medicines can be produced very cheaply. It's not, it's not hard to make a pill. What's hard is to know what to put into it and how, how exactly to manufacture this active component. And that's what the patent is on. So um, if you're able to produce and distribute medicine at marginal cost, meaning only the cost of producing the pill, not the cost of the license, you have, is, or you as a developing country, no, developing countries do have great advantages then. Um, so it's easy to see why these restrictions on access to knowledge in the educational realm or in the medical realm I'm just using these examples here, how they block development. Sick people can't work. Uneducated people are not going to be very productive. Um, another point is that what is good for developing countries usually helps us too. If it's easy to uh, get permission to use copyrighted material in education, uh, education will let it get a lot more interesting and rich, even here because our schools do not have um, too much money either. It's not as bad as in Zimbabwe, say, but uh, still. So um, generous fair use, like what, this is what it's called if you're given um, sort of leave from copyright, if you're allowed something uh, to use something even though it's copyrighted. And alternative licensing models, like the uh, GNU licenses, the GPL or Creative Commons licenses are potentially very useful because they permit us all to access knowledge. But how is access to knowledge regulated? Um, those of you, who, who has heard the two preceding lectures? Just raise your hands, please. Okay, now I'll just, I'll just do a short introduction then. Um, so I'm talking about mainly two modes of regulation on access to knowledge here. One is copyright or author's rights, Urheberrecht. Uh, the other would be patents, because that's, uh, the ones, those, are, those are the ones that have the most impact. Copyrights, to start with, go uh, for text, for music, for software, and um, give economic and sometimes moral privileges to the creator of a work or to the copyright holder who has bought the copyright from the creator which is much more often the case. For example, music companies buy the copyright from the creators of the music and then hold the copyrights. That is why I'm going to refer to them as rights holders. Uh, copyright protection now lasts in Germany 70 years. In the United States, it's author's life plus 70 years. So you create, if an author creates something at, thir at 30 today and uh, goes on to live for another 50 years, um, and then has 70 years copyright protection. That makes 120 years. That's pretty impressive. Especially regarding the fact that copyright is intended um, as an incentive for people to produce. So what good is it to give an incentive to produce to a dead person? I'm not going to produce anything if I'm dead, no matter how much you pay me. Um, for patents, it's not, it's not quite as dramatic. Patents refer to technical inventions, um, such as machines using the forces of nature. That was in the, in the software patent debate that got very heated this summer, uh, an important formula. Um, patents confer exclusivity on an invention in exchange for publishing how this invention works. Then the person holding the patent, or the company usually holding the patent, because have, uh, asking for a patent and administering one, especially enforcing one, is very expensive. So it's usually a company behind those. Um, gets 20 years to profit from this exclusively. Afterwards, it's public domain, like, like copyrighted things that, uh, where, where the protection has run out. They go into the public domain, it's called. They're accessible to anyone then, and anyone can use them. So, why haven't I been using the term intellectual property so far? Because I don't like it. Because I think it's a propaganda term, really. Um, I especially dislike the property part in intellectual property. Because it simply, ideas, knowledge, is not material property. As Maike, my predecessor here, has mentioned, um, knowledge can be copied, can be uh, distributed, at no cost, or at least can, can at least be copied at no cost. 
um, and in any quantity you want. So uh, if, if we start calling knowledge property, um, what we do, or those, those people who call knowledge property, what they really do is uh, they appeal to the respect for material property that is much more deeply rooted in our societies. Uh, the respect for private property, which refers to material property. Um, a good example here is the US Constitution. We all know that the United States probably have, uh, well, are among the countries that have the most regard for private property in the world. But then the people who wrote the Constitution there, they said, no, you shouldn't have property on ideas, really. All you should get is we, we, we have to find a compromise here. We have to get our citizens to create as much as possible so that our society will advance. But then we have to make this knowledge accessible to everyone. And we have to find a compromise between these two, between the creator's wish to, to profit and um, society's need to, uh, to access knowledge. So what they said is we d we'll do this for a limited time. Um, and that is the exact difference from material property. Because uh, your right to uh, your computer or your right to own your, I don't know what, your mattress, whatever, does not run out after a certain time. Um, so this property term ev hides this possibility of lossless sharing and evokes fears of something being taken away from you if you share an idea, if someone uses your idea. Then the term intellectual property is really imprecise. It mixes together very different areas of law. It, uh, people saying intellectual property often mean copyright, patents, trademarks, denominations of origin, industrial design. All this could be called intellectual property, but all these are areas of law that function very differently. Um, and should, treat, should be treated differently. I've seen many discussions between qualified people go to waste because uh, some people insisted on using the term intellectual property and then no one was sure if they were talking about copyrights or patents or chip designs, you know? Um, besides, as I've mentioned, the term ignores that copyrights and patents are just tools to achieve uh, greater creativity in society. They're there to give an incentive, but in my opinion, they're being mishandled right now. They're being uh, handled or changed uh, too much in the favor of the rights holders, and the aspect that they're really there to benefit the public has been almost forgotten. So what is intellectual property then? Let's say it like this. It's monopoly privileges. Uh, a copyright is a monopoly privilege for given for a certain time, a patent as a monopoly privilege. That's important to remember. So um, where do we want to go? Uh, FSF Europe is among uh, a group of organizations working for a treaty on access to knowledge. This treaty would, if all goes well, be an international treaty at the United Nations level, much like the TRIPS treaty I'll mention in a second. Um, to put the public first, to get patents and copyrights back to their original function of fostering creativity instead of um, just being a tool for profit. I, I'm, I, there's nothing wrong with profit, don't get me wrong, but um, society has to come first. So um, this treaty would create a legal base to protect cultural freedom. It would be a sort of trips in reverse. Who of you has heard of trips treaty? Who of you has actually read a bit of it? All right. <laughs> um, then I'll just say a few words on that. Uh, the tri TRIPS stands for Trade Related Aspects of Intellectual Property Rights. It's a treaty uh, signed in roughly 1995 by the, world, by the members of the World Trade Organization. Um, and it sets minimum standards for monopoly protection it, sa it says, for example, all the countries that have signed this treaty have to have copyright durations of 50 years, minimum. They can go above it if they choose. It says, for example, um, all the countries that have signed this treaty have to 
have uh, patent protection of 20 years. All the countries signing this treaty have to provide for um, legislation to enforce these monopoly privileges. And um, this slide is supposed to be a very, very short comparison of the TRIPS treaty and the proposed access to knowledge treaty. While TRIPS sets minimum standards for monopoly protection, the access to knowledge treaty would set minimum standards for access to knowledge. Uh, and so um, the TRIPS treaty in setting minimum standards says you can always go above it. You can extend the duration of copyright. You can restrict even further what, uh, what normal people with not-for-profit motives um, can do with copyrighted material. The Access to Knowledge Treaty, which on the other hand uh, say you must provide a minimum of access and if you choose to as a country, if you think it's beneficial to your society, you can go and give more access and give less protection to the monopolies. Um, the durations are just one example, but they're the most clear, that's why I'm using it here. Very important also, the TRIPS Treaty um, puts down all the re required mechanisms for monopoly protection. It says you have to have this kind of institution, you have to have this kind of law that allows rights holders to enforce their monopoly privileges. Um, while the Access to Knowledge Treaty enumerates the required freedoms, it says you have to allow your people to do this and that and that and that with the material. But um, if, you, if you manage to give all, give all these permissions and still um, tighten or uh, tighten monopoly protection, then fine. But you have, to, you have to give these permissions. That's the end of part one. Uh, I'll just, just to summarize, um, I've I've ho I hope to have made the point that access to knowledge is essential for culture and development because it really le uh, knowledge is really what integrates us into a culture. Then that the term intellectual property is really a mistake. It really refers only to monopoly privileges on ideas. And this is why we need, to, um, why, why we need a treaty on access to knowledge to protect our cultural freedom from restrictions like those of the TRIPS Treaty and from restrictions that are uh, much stricter, the so-called TRIPS Plus treaties, which are coming right now. Because um, the rights holders, above all uh, companies like Time Warner, uh, Sony, BMG Universal, etc., uh, say, well, we need more protection to be able to, you know, pay our bands more, which really means pay our managers more. Um, and that is why we need treaties that have the TRIPS protection plus something. So it's the TRIPS plus treaties. Okay, any questions so far? Yes. About intellectual property, um, I see the problem that someone who's really uh, making investments into research or someone who wants to make art needs financial freedom and uh, has to get that back in some way. Absolutely, I agree. And uh, the Access to Knowledge Treaty and our work is not about taking away the financial incentive to develop ideas. Uh, and it's not about crashing the copyright system and replacing it with universal communism. Um, but it's about rebalancing copyright. It's about, you know, and the, the balance of what copyright is used for, especially copyright and patents, has shifted, in our view, too far in the rights holders' favor because they have the lobbies. They have the money, which means usually the money to pay the dinners with the lawmakers, um, which is how lobbying, how lobbying works, okay? So, um, we're just trying to shift it back in the public interest. All right, then on to the second part. How can access to knowledge be promoted? Um, for example, by individuals or by NGOs. There's different possibilities. You can talk to rights holders. 
you can go to them and say, um, look, there's this new thing, it's called, for example, Creative Commons, and uh, it's really cool, and you could, uh, if, if, you, if you adjust your business model in the right way, you stand to profit a lot from this. So, um, and we could explain them how. And some of them might actually pick up on it. It's uh, much more obvious in, in the software range where there are indeed many small and medium-sized companies that uh, do, for example, GNU Linux support. You can talk to lawmakers, the people who make the framework for the economy and the framework for the culture, um, and ask them to please take account of the, of the public interest and not only of the interest of, um, uh, of big rights-holding companies. And you can go where the, um, where the initial push on the lawmakers comes from, uh, which is usually the United Nations. And in the area of intellectual monopoly rights, it's WIPO, the World Intellectual Property Organization, which, well, just to introduce you to this organization, which is uh, not exactly well known, it's a specialized United Nations agency, for example, like uh, the UNESCO, which is much better known, which is there for education. Uh, WIPO is there for intellectual monopoly rights. A specialized UN agency um, treat, dealing with treaties on monopolies on ideas. Uh, it grew from the offices that administ the, administered the Paris and the Berne Convention. Both conventions stem from the end of the 19th century. Um, and concern copyrights and patents, respectively. WIPO sees as its mandate, I quote, to promote the protection of intellectual property throughout the world. If you look at this closely, you will see that um, it's about protection and intellectual property. They, they're pushing, the, the direction of their work is really just to um, tighten the enforcement of monopoly privileges. It's not, they're not about access, at least not until now. Um, they're about uh, restricting access to knowledge as far as possible, about turning knowledge, making knowledge scarce, so that you can put a better price on it. What does WIPO do? What is, what is in, its, in its tasks? It drafts and administers treaties on um, intellectual monopoly rights. Uh, the TRIPS Treaty would, have, would really have been something for WIPO. It um, did not end up there. It ended up at the World Trade Organization for reasons of internal United Nations politics, especially because the United States thought that WIPO was too, f too much in favor of the developing countries. Um, well, which might tell you where the, w where the WTO stands. Um, WIPO does technical assistance, as they call it. They uh, send people to developing countries to help these countries set up enforcement offices for monopoly rights on ideas. Um, this is a problem, especially in two ways. One, it costs scarce resources. Uh, it might be, well, if, it, it might be more essential to provide uh, clean water to your population than to set up an office that takes the money from the country and channels it to Time Warner and Sony. Because the money is really needed in the country. It's not needed in the United States, at least not as badly. Um, or in Europe, for that matter. And well, while they're there, these WIPO officials set, helping to set up these offices and uh, teaching the, the people who are going to work there the basics of um, intellectual monopoly rights, often forget that even the TRIPS Treaty has certain flexibilities. Um, they, they just don't tell these people, you know? They don't mention to them that, for example, the TRIPS Treaty gives a, every nation a right that to, for example, in the case of, an, of a national emergency like South Africa experienced, um, to issue compulsory licenses, meaning to take a patent from, from a company and say, well, sorry, we can't respect it. It's, our people are dying. Um, we just allow this and that company in our country to manufacture medicine. TRIPS ha well, does sort of allow this. And um, 
WIPO officials sometimes don't tell the people they're, they're um, educating there about this. But then WIPO only sets the framework of uh, the framework for the laws that the member countries then are going to implement. So what is decided at WIPO is not written in stone there. Each country has its own ways of interpreting this. Well, after talking about what WIPO does do, um, now for what WIPO could do, in our opinion, and what WIPO would be an excellent tool for once we've uh, reconfigured it a bit. Uh, we could, you know, WIPO is sort of the master key to this, to this international system of intellectual monopoly rights. Um, the, the root axis, if you will. If, you, if we could get WIPO to implement corresponding treaties, like the Access to Knowledge Treaty, we could get it to put public interest before individual profit. We would not have to fight this out in every single of the 180-something countries that populate this world, no. It would just one organization would do. We could stop the TRIPS plus treaties. Uh, some are really more curious, like the, for example, the proposed broadcast treaty, which is being negotiated right now, which would give a sort of something copyright nobody really understands to organizations for the mere act of broadcasting something. Uh, so if I'm a radio station and I have an author coming to me saying, look, I got this great feature and I have the copyright in it, would you please broadcast? We negotiate a treaty, uh, I as the radio station broadcast this. Fine, that's how it works today. Um, and then under the broadcast treaty, I would, the, the, copy, the author would retain his copyright, but I would also get a sort of broadcast copyright in whatever I broadcast there. And this would immediately create a thicket of laws, or a, a thicket of rights that, um, no one would be able to manage. The only people to profit from this would be uh, lawyers specializing in intellectual monopoly rights. Even broadcasting organizations have said they don't want this. <laughs> um, we could use WIPO to shorten copyright duration the world over. So uh, while, it, while Tripp says you have to have a minimum of 50 years of uh, copyright protection, the, an access to knowledge treaty says the, there's a proposed draft uh, says you, have a, you can only have a maximum 50 years of copyright protection. If you choose to go below it, fine. This is the sort of limit we could implement there. Uh, we could put limits on patentability. We could end the software patent debate once and for all. Um, also, there's no need to patent medicines really. India for, long, for a long time has only protected them by copyright and went quite well. Uh, patents on life are another debatable matter. And we could stop the criminalization of copyright infringement. Today, if you infringe someone's copyright, you don't, you don't go to jail necessarily. Rather, uh, they can come to you and say, well, you've infringed my copyright, I've lost money because of that, would you please repay that money? And you say, okay, here's your money. That's how it works, and sometimes there's a court in between, but not necessarily. Um, there, the EU is handling one or two proposals where um, this, uh, the mere act of unauthorized copying, which some people choose to call piracy, um, becomes a crime. So it's something you go to jail for. And uh, only recently some uh, managers of, of big companies have spoken up and said, well, but this is stupid. We have our engineers. They don't, if they, for example, don't know the whole market and they develop a new idea, um, which someone else has had before, it happens, um, and we sell this and we're unaware of the copyright, all of a sudden we co we're committing a crime, our managers go to jail. This could, this could create a problem. <laughs> we don't want to go to jail. <laughs> so um, there's even big rights holding companies in uh, countering that. Well, a first step now into WIPO, a first step towards access to knowledge, towards changing WIPO into uh, an organization promoting access to knowledge instead of promoting um, ever more restrictive handling of uh, intellectual monopoly rights is the so-called development agenda. This is a proposal brought on by a group of countries the, the calling themselves the Friends of Development led by Brazil and Argentina. Uh, I've listed uh, some of the others here actually by now. 
some hundred developing countries have signed on to this. Um, and they say, we want to reform WIPO. We want WIPO to put more emphasis on the, on the public interest instead of only looking towards uh, ensuring the greatest possible profit opportunities for rights holders. Uh, and this could be done in a number of ways, which, um, well, uh, the documents are online if you choose to read through all 100 pages. <laughs> but, um, for example, promoting technology transfer. Um, letting, having more open uh, conditions for developing countries to uh, make use of patterns of the developed world. Or um, safeguarding public interest flexibilities the way the Access to Knowledge Treaty would do. Um, writing, actually writing down all those exceptions everyone is using every day, like uh, the use of copyrighted material in education. That's very important. And then, finally, the development agenda says, well, WIPO should have its work reviewed, which is something that most organizations do. Uh, even, well, companies pay a lot of money to uh, consultants to review their processes because they know it's good for them. WIPO says, nah, we don't need this. No, we're doing it right. Don't. Don't. <laughs> it would cost money to review, you know? Um, what's happened with the development agenda? Until now, it's mainly been talks about talks, talks about procedural matters, which some people suspect um, is a blocking strategy by, uh, by the Western countries, especially the United States, which are totally opposed to, um, to the development agenda. So um, finally, they've agreed to have two more meetings in the coming year, in February and uh, June, I believe and then produce recommendations on what to do with the development agenda for WIPO's General Assembly. So um, this is a very slow process. There's, there are no fireworks usually in the United Nations processes. It's all big mountains of paper and lots of boredom. But um, what is important in our view is that the debate about access to knowledge has reached the United Nations level. It's there. Um, it's being debated in diplomatic um, assemblies and it will not go away anymore, that simply. That is why the Access to Knowledge Treaty is important. Let's see what we have here. Oh yeah, that's why the Access to Knowledge Treaty is important because it provides the draft that has been drawn up in May last year, provides a sort of rallying point for a lot of NGOs uh, who came together to negotiate this draft and say, okay, this is what we need. We are the organization of blind people. We need this and that in the treaty. We are the organization of the hearing impaired. We need the, this and that. Um, with the Free Software Foundation, we want, uh, for example, uh, a prohibition of software patents. So that's what the, this Access to Knowledge Treaty is good for. And we hope to take it much further. Um, what does the Free Software Foundation Europe do at WIPO? We believe that free software is essential for access to knowledge. Maike, before this has talked about uh, free software and the digital divide. Um, we believe that software being codified knowledge uh, really should be accessible to all. And with the GPL and the, some other licenses, we have the tools to do it. Then we inform country and industry delegates about free software alternative models because many of them have not actually heard um, that there is such a thing as free software. And we consciously, we usually put on suits and ties and go all um, and talk to them very nicely, hand them fancy cards and all that, because uh, we want to, well, <laughs> we're, we want to show them that we're in favor of business if you just do it right. Then, uh, well, improve the legal conditions for free software, like prohibiting patents, getting free software into WIPO's development work, um, getting WIPO to in the way of technology transfer, teach developing countries about free software. That would be a great thing if they could just take on that task. And of course, we connect with other NGOs. That's how a good part of the Access to Knowledge Treaty came about, because all the NGOs met at WIPO and said, oh, look, there's something going wrong here. And finally, we're, we want to turn WIPO into, in, from the World Intellectual Property Organization to the World Intellectual Wealth Organization. Because we believe that 
really there is a good place for such an organization promoting intellectual wealth the world over. Just to summarize this part, um, WIPO is the root access to international treaties on intellectual monopoly rights and uh, access to knowledge. The development agenda is a first step towards the idea of access to knowledge, the concept of access to knowledge being recognized uh, far, on, on a far greater level than before. And uh, the Free Software Foundation Europe, together with many other organizations like the Electronic Frontier Foundation, like Doctors Without Borders, is working to turn WIPO into a world intellectual wealth organization. So what can you do? You don't have to sit by the sidelines. Um, you can stay informed, at least. You can read about this. You can discuss this. The topic is becoming ever more important, and there's more and more being written about it. And if you start writing about it too, run a blog, do something, um, that'll be a contribution. You can lobby politicians and businesses. You can go to them and say, hey, look, this is what's important to me, or I have a, cons I have a, a software consultancy, and this is why, for example, we need laws that um, give or have, that leave space for free software, or this is why um, in public tender, uh, free software needs a place. You can criticize the concept of intellectual property because it's really a propaganda term, because it's not property, because it's a monopoly right, and there's no need to handle it as restrictively as uh, is being done right now. You can pick your favorite public interest NGO and support it. Uh, <laughs> we wouldn't mind, frankly. <laughs> we have a support club, the Fellowship of the Free Software Foundation Europe, reachable under fsfe.org. Uh, and with the, well, there's a yearly fee of, um, if you choose to pay full fee, 120 euros, minimum 60. And uh, for, with these fees, it's been up for about a year now, with these fees, we've, for example, managed to hire someone working full time for us in Brussels. Uh, which we just couldn't afford before. And this person has been very instrumental in, um, in the fight against software patents. You can promote alternative, so uh, alternative models, create and use free software, and create and use free content. Uh, show your friends what's cool about free software. And you finally can explain the problem to two of your friends. Even if one forgets, the other one will carry it on. That was that. Uh, questions, please. Um, to take a devil's advocate position, um, the current excuse right... Me? Excuse me, the, the what position? A devil's advocate position. It's a position I don't really believe in myself, but... <laughs> um, the current rights holders will claim that by protecting profit, they are doing the best for society as a whole. Does the FSFE have an answer to that attack when it will surely come up? Uh, in fact, we do, because it does f quite frequently come up. At WIPO, where we are registered as permanent observers, um, a lot of pharma companies uh, run this argument. They say, well, if we have stricter monopoly protection um, in places like India, and places like South Africa, we can make a lot more money. This is what they actually say. And then, again, nothing wrong with making money. Um, and then take this money and give it away by, for example, selling the medicine cheaper. Um, which is quite intriguing to me, because why would you have to run the money through the company first? Uh, <laughs> we could greatly simplify this process. Again, I'm... Uh, I'm fully convinced that uh, research is expensive and creation, creativity needs incentives and deserves incentives. But um, we have to keep in mind that the public interest has to be the priority, that patents and copyrights are just tools, not ends in themselves. More questions, please. I can't have been that clear, possibly. Or are you just tired? <laughs> so.
So picking up on the last question, what do you think would a model look like that protects companies in a way that they have an incentive to really put a lot of money into um, developing new medicine and solutions like that and still be good for everyone? Uh, well, we don't need a big new model. I'm not proposing a great new office anywhere, no. Um, our conviction is that the, the current copyright and patent system is basically just a, a good thing. It just needs to be tweaked back to where it came from. It just needs to be, um, well, not, not even restructured. We just need to adapt the, 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 the terms, so to speak, um, so that the public can profit. And there is a lot of leeway to um, left open to, to maneuver here, you know? Um, we, can, we can do this without driving all the companies into ruin. How does the Free Software Foundation Europe work? How does it, how it works? Um, do you mean where we get our money from? Or? Uh, no, where are you? How many people is uh, involved on the okay. foundation? Um, well, we're basically a volunteer organization. Um, we started in 2001 and uh, have since, well, we, we're a core team of uh, maybe 12, 15 people, structured as a Verein in Germany, well, an association, non-profit association. Um, but we're a European network. So there's a general assembly meeting once a year uh, where people from uh, all over Europe the 12, it's, I think it's 12 members in the General Assembly right now, come and uh, decide on the administrative issues and take care of all the legal proceedings necessary for such an association. And then we have a lot of very, very helpful volunteers, uh, most, mostly coordinated via mailing lists or the fellowship, um, who do, for example, translation work, um, who develop new ideas, new projects, and say, well, look, I, I've got an idea here, and I would like to support for it, and what could we do? Um, we have, at the moment, I think, four full-time people. Our president, Georg Greve, um, a press speaker, uh, the person in Brussels, and, um, oh yeah, half an Italian chancellor. Well, he's, <laughs> he's working half-time. Um, so these are the people that get money, and the rest is working volunteer. So, and what's, what really keeps us going is um, the, the great big pool of volunteers we're drawing from. There are, uh, in most European countries, national chapters, more or less developed, um, that uh, contribute a lot to our work. By the way, we're having a fellowship party on the 19th of January here in Berlin, uh, in the New Thinking Store, in case you know it. Um, they have little flyers or uh, booklets lying around here. Um, you'd all be very welcome. I'd be glad to see you there. Anything else? Okay. Thank you very much for your attention.